Hello, everyone. Um, welcome, uh, everyone, to our webinar. My name is Dana Posti. I'm a PhD student at Tel Aviv University, and I will be your moderator for today. Um, so uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Adas Maman. Uh, Professor Maman is the head of the Environmental Engineering Program at Tel Aviv University and IUPA Vice President for the Europe, Middle East, Africa region. She is an expert in disinfection and oxidation of water and wastewater using solar, UV, and ozone technology to create this centralized system for safe water in rural and low-income areas. Professor Maman is also committed to provide safe water in developing countries, currently serving as a visiting faculty at IIT Madras, India. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Dana. Uh, so first, I'd like to thank everyone for joining uh, this uh, joint webinar between the IWA and the IUVA, which is dedicated to our most most important resource, which is actually water. Um, so IUVA is the International um, Ultraviolet Association, is a nonprofit organization and a vibrant family with scientists, engineers, vendors and regulators that discuss issues related to UV disinfection. Okay, so everyone actually should get access to clean water and UV disinfection can play a role in it. In 2021, Nathan Moore and I established a new task force that supports the UN SDG 6 to provide safe water for all. UV disinfection does not require chemicals, it does not change the taste of water, and is efficient in providing safe water. Therefore, it could support the UN SDG 6. Also, the burden of safe water falls mostly on women and girls, especially in low-income settings. And this was our inspiration for this webinar. Our task force members come from various places in the world with different settings and different experience. However, the reality is the UV disinfection is not implemented widely. Next slide, please. So how are we doing this? We set various meetings uh, with uh, organizations such as the World Bank and others. Next slide, please. We also promoted discussion with peoples around the globe in order to understand their experiences and best practices. Next slide, please. We created a selection of 19 case studies that highlight the wide, wide range of UV disinfection systems being implemented in decentralized water treatment and real humanitarian relief in low and middle income settings. The case studies cover a wide range of projects in multiple scales, including schools, hospitals, communities, households, and healthcare facilities across all the continents around the world. Moreover, uh, we established a white paper um, that, uh, that looks at the different case studies and looks at the background, the UV systems, the outcomes, and the lessons learned. We invite you to join our efforts in submitting case studies through our IUVA website. Thank you very much, Dana. Back to you. Thanks, Adas. Okay, so to start, we will conducting a quick poll to learn about who are you and what your motivation to join us today. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, so in one here, you can see that the poll is appear, and in one minute, we will share the results. Okay, so please let me know when we can share it. Okay, interesting. So thank you very much for that. And, and now let's start um, with our speakers. I'm excited to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Bavani Rao. Uh, Dr. Rao, uh, the Dean of the School of Social and Behavioral Science at Amorita University, a top ranked university based in Kerala, India. Dr. Rao is not only the director of two research uh, centers, the first one, the Amarita Multimodal Application, using computer and human interaction lab, 
and the Center for Women's Inter uh, Empowerment and Gender Equality, but also holds the distinguished position of India's UNESCO Chair in Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment, empowerment since uh, two, uh, two, uh, 2016. She is currently the co-coordinate of the Working Group on Gender Equality and Disabilities for Civil 20. Dr. Bahavani has led numerous field and research projects uh, funded by international and national institutions focusing on technology-based training for underserved communities, especially women in rural India. Her work has been recognized through numerous publications, patents and awards. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Bhavani Rao. Thank you, Dana, for that very warm welcome. Hello, everyone. I can see that people are here from all over the world. So hi from the south of India. I'm just going to give you a quick idea about uh, some of the work that we do, not going into it too technically, but just like an overview. Uh, first, let me set the context, just the context in India. We are a very large country in terms of our population, um, the second largest in the world right now. And 70% of India's water sources are contaminated. And the levels of water in our major reservoirs have fallen to 21% of the average just over the last decade. As you know, I'm sure that most of you know that India is a very large consumer and producer of both rice and wheat. 54% uh, of the country's groundwater is declining faster than it is replenished. And 75% of the households do not have drinking water on their premises. 84% of the rural households do not have access to piped water. And the declining water table causes also with it is increase of toxic elements within the water. So specifically, of how does it impact people? Most importantly, more, many Indians face very high levels of stress, water stress. Uh, this is according to our country's uh, annual reports produced by Niti Aayog on the SDGs and the performance of the country towards the SDGs. Uh, the de dependence on a very erratic, uh, I'm sure that you know that probably related to climate change, but the monsoon seasons are not predictable. And this uh, puts also a lot of uh, dependence on groundwater. Uh, there's lack of water connections and toilets uh, are still over the large parts of the country, and this leads to waterborne illnesses, stunting in many parts of India, and of course, at times, death. Uh, we have 18% of the world's population, but only 4% of the water resources of the world, and 15% of India's population practices open defecation at about 200 million of people. Um, sometimes they have toilets, but they just won't use it. Uh, more than 6% of India's population of uh, 1.3 billion, uh, which is approximately 91 million, lack access to safe water. And this is the very uh, grim outlook that we have in the Indian context when it comes to water. So I'd like to talk to you about women, water and sanitation and the link between these. Um, as you know, the reason that we write the reason that we work with women is women are the keepers of all the vulnerable populations. They're the ones who care for children. They care for the elderly. They care for the disabled. Um, they care for the water resources, the fields, uh, the cattle, and the environment as a whole while being vulnerable themselves. And therefore, the largest impact that we've ha we feel we have, in, especially in rural India, is through the women. Women and water, especially in rural situations, are very intellect. When women are the ones who go to fetch water on a daily basis, with an exception of very few communities. In fact, there was a very interesting uh, exercise that we did in human-robot interaction. So we dressed uh, an autonomous robot as a water carrier with no gender. And the robot would go and bring water from the source and deliver it at the house at the, at the doorsteps of the people. And while we were uh, questioning people about their perception of the robot, and we asked them what gender they thought the robot had, and the robot had was given a male voice. It spoke in a male voice, and it looked non-descriptive. But people automatically gave, assigned the gender of the robot as female, 
And when asked why they did that, it is because the robot brought water and that's normally a woman's job. It's so entrenched in our psyche that women are the ones that actually bring water. Um, so it was something that was quite revealing to us and how ingrained some of our attitudes are. Anyway, so also because of lack of toilets and lack of hygiene, the women are at a risk at violence, gender-based violence, while going to remote places to defecate. Um, and uh, there's a very critical need for clean water, access to clean water, especially when women have uh, menstruation uh, and and pregnancy. And during the postnatal period, it's very critical for women to have access to good water. Um, of course, uh, it's, there's a direct link between uh, SDG 5 and SDG 6. And in fact, target uh, SDG 6.2 says access, access to equitable sanitation and hygiene and women's and girls' needs. It's actually specifically mentioned. Of course, uh, SDG 10 is to reduce inequalities, which is access to clean water and sanitation brings with it uh, inequalities when you don't have equal access. So at, the un at our university, we have a very um, novel mandate. Uh, all research at Amrita should be done based on compassion and for the benefit of community. This is a mandate across our university. So we work um, right now, I close to 150 communities in rural India, spread across the entire length and breadth of India. And uh, one of the main areas that I personally work on is, of course, uh, women's empowerment, but also directly linked to both water and sanitation. We also have another very large project done by another group within the university that is to provide customized clean drinking water solutions to rural communities. They're targeting 5,000 communities. They've already finished over 250 communities. So this is our summary of our, some of the work that we have done. Um, I would say close to about 50% of the work that we have done actually involves either sanitation or water, uh, but predominantly through a building of skills and capacity in women. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, 2018, uh, the state where I'm presently located was uh, impacted by very, very severe flooding. It's a state that has pretty reasonable water resources, but all the water resources were contaminated by really bad flooding, landslides. And uh, so at that point of time, in the peak, there was no clean drinking water access to many communities. So Israel came uh, to our aid and the, and the conflict of Israel provided very novel systems of uh, providing clean drinking water to rural communities. Uh, the advantage of the system is actually, it's a very interesting system. It's It recycles uh, what is used in uh, dialysis filtration. So the filters that are used for dialysis in hospitals are sanitized and, and they are fitted into this filtration system. So it could be manually used and you can take really dirty water that is completely, uh, which just has all kinds of turbidity and all kinds of uh, um, pathogens, and it can go through this system and come come out completely portable. So it's a very interesting system to deploy during disaster times. Um, it, however, it is not so easily maintained during regular time when when you all have regular needs and. Uh, this thing. So, but it was a very during the time when it was deployed, it was something that was brought a lot of relief uh, to the communities it served. And this is how uh, our relationship with Professor Hadas uh, from Tel Aviv University started. And um, it was, uh, and since it has has uh, grown. Uh, another very interesting uh, project that we did with women and sanitation is that uh, we worked across eighteen uh, states. Uh, in, in 18 villages in India, from one from each state. Uh, our target, we, we started with 21 villages, we came down to 18. And uh, we trained women to be sanitation ambassadors in that a part of them were trained to actually build toilets for their, themselves and for others in the village. So we piggybacked onto the Swaj Bharat scheme, which uh, basically the government was giving funds for people to build toilets but the way we approached it is to first build skills among women who were basically, um, they were agricultural laborers. So they would work in the fields when it was um, agriculture season and they would be material movers at a construction site when it was not the agriculture season. So instead of being uh, unskilled, uh, lowly paid uh, 
laborers, they could now learn a skill like masonry, plumbing, plastering, and they could earn wages of a skilled person. But the process, they would build their own toilets, they would also build toilets for others, and they would be paid for their uh, work through the Swachh Bharat mission. Um, 18 of these villages, all 18 of them, by the time we were done with the project, were certified by the government as op open defecation free, which means over 60% of their community have toilets. Yes, now I would like to talk to you about the WISE project. This is the one that we are doing in collaboration with uh, Professor Hadas. And here our idea was is to train uh, women in villages to be water ambassadors. So they learn how to monitor the quality and quantity of water in their villages. So we started this in two places, uh, one in Kerala and one in Karnataka. The project is uh, co-funded by the Consulate of Israel in to South India. And uh, we have actually successfully completed training 10 water ambassadors and they have over the last six months collected data and monitored the data at the household level for over 1,000 households in the place in the district of Raichur uh, in Karnataka in the place called Dangrampur. And it's very interesting. Uh, in this very district, uh, there were at least eight deaths due to water contamination uh, before we started the project. So it's a community-based approach to uh, clean drinking water. And the women, what our next step in this is to make sure that we link the women and their role, not just to go and monitor the water, but also link them to the government program, which we have. We have a government call, a program called the Jal Jeevan program, which uh, aims to provide clean drinking water to the doorsteps of women in every household. Um, it is led by the community and it's supposed to be um, motivated and designed by the community. Uh, what is interesting is if the community doesn't actually have awareness of what needs to be done, this is not something that's really going to pan out. So we, what we figured is that there is such, uh, we're still uh, doing the research on it, but there, is, there are such low levels of awareness of what even clean drinking water means. And uh, uh, what people live with and what people's bodies have gotten adjusted to. Uh, so it's, it's if this particular uh, scheme of the government to give clean drinking water access to the entire country has to pan out in the best way, it is critical that women are a part of this, but not just in for namesake. They have to be educated, they have to have awareness, and they should be able to create that same awareness in the entire community. So we foresee a lot of work in this area uh, before this. we see that this particular government scheme can actually realize what it hopes to realize. And that is a part of what we're working on. This is the future of the work that we're doing. Um, before I uh, finish, I would like to say that uh, this year, India hosts the G20 presidency and uh, our university is a part of the Civil Civil 20, which brings the voices of civil society to the government and influences the policies that are accepted by the government. As a part of that, I am chairing the group that is working on gender equality and disability, a part of our working groups agenda is also to look into women and water. So if anybody who is listening today is interested in lending their voices, their experience, their knowledge into the discussions, the policy discussions on women and water, because it's not just India, it's about all the G20 countries and beyond these, these decisions and policies that are adopted actually influence so much more. So we would be happy to welcome you to a lend your voices to our conversation, bring your knowledge, bring your best practices, use them to inform policy instead of unthought of policy. So again, this is an open invitation. I'll post the links on the chat as soon as I'm done. Again, uh, I would love to invite all of you from all over the world to participate in that conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lavani. Um, and next up, we have the pleasure uh, of hearing from Dr. Natalie Hu. Dr. Hull, Assistant Professor in Civil Environmental Engineering at the Ohio State University. 
Dr. Hull's research focus is on sustainable water treatment engineering and microbiomes at fundamental and system scale to protect human and environmental health. HealthLab, the water team, conducted fundamental research on UV water treatment to combat microbial threats and system research on the links between water microbiomes and human health. She earned her BS, MS, and PhD in civil and environmental engineering from University of Kentucky and the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, as a postgraduate research, she explored the microbiomes and the toxicity of drinking water and wastewater. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Natalie Hu. Thanks so much for the kind introduction and thank you all for joining the webinar today. I'm excited to share with you about some of the more fundamental scale ways that we've been investigating ways to overcome some of the challenges that are associated with implementing UV in general, which can definitely be exacerbated in small rural areas. And as the other speakers will point out, this can disproportionately negatively affect women. So just to set the stage for why we're focusing on UV, we know that chlorine is commonly used in many parts of the world for managing microbiological water quality, but there are drawbacks whether for both achieving an adequate disinfection or whether you do achieve adequate disinfection. If you don't get enough disinfection, you could have taste and odor problems, biofilms could develop, pathogens can proliferate in your water system. On the other hand, if you do achieve adequate disinfection with chlorine, there are still could be some drawbacks. The residual chlorine could be depleted in the distribution system or during storage of water. You have to use chemicals, they cause taste and odor problems, and you have to manage a delicate balance between achieving adequate disinfection while minimizing disinfection byproducts. And so that's why we focus on UV as an alternative or complementary technology. But it also has drawbacks that we're trying to figure out how to overcome. Achieving adequate disinfection with UV has traditionally relied on fragile mercury lamps, which can be toxic if the mercury is released to the environment. Also, UV provides no residual. There's no chemical that stays in the water to keep disinfecting it and keep it safe. And also, UV requires electricity. So these are some of the challenges we've been focusing on. And uh, UV complements chlorine disinfection, so they're not mutually exclusive. They could be used together because, in general, the sensitivity of various infectious agents to UV is opposite their sensitivity to chlorine. But what we know about UV from the long history over the past century with mercury lamps is that UV has a proven history of disinfection. So for low pressure mercury lamps that emit a single wavelength at 254 nanometers, there is um, a lot of literature demonstrating disinfection of different classes of microorganisms and infectious agents across a range of doses. Whenever we look at medium pressure mercury lamps, those emit many more wavelengths across the UV spectrum, in addition to other wavelengths across the whole electromagnetic spectrum. But what we see from medium pressure disinfection is that if you look across the same classes of microorganisms and infectious agents, the doses required to achieve the same level of disinfection compared to low pressure mercury lamps are lower. So this indicates that there's some advantage from having multiple wavelengths. If we look at the sensitivity of different pathogens or indicator microorganisms, viruses across the UVC spectrum, we can see that there are regions of this where the dose required to inactivate them are lowest. We can target these local minima where these infectious agents or indicators are most sensitive to UV to design the most optimal systems. And what is exciting uh, nowadays is that there are mercury-free UV sources that also allow us to select the wavelengths and start to overcome that first challenge of having to rely on toxic mercury lamps. So some of the mercury-free UV sources we've been focusing on in my lab include eczema lamps, uh, krypton chloride eczema lamps, and light-emitting diodes. And light-emitting diodes 
can have selectable wavelengths based on varying the material composition of the semiconductor. And we typically focus on these uh, three wavelengths here. And then the krypton chloride excimer lamp, it emits um, quasi-monochromatic radiation at 222 nanometers. And I'm going to share some information on both of these. And what is great is that we are targeting those regions where infectious agents and microbes are most sensitive to UV by selecting these wavelengths. So to look at a case study where we implemented some UV LEDs in the field, first we investigated the disinfection by our UV LED flow through system, this Pearl Aqua unit here, across a range of flow rates and water qualities by measuring the UV absorbance, UVA, and as a function of flow rate here. And we measured log inactivation of MS2 bacteriophage, an indicator virus. And we were able to develop this uh, combined variable model to have a way to predict MS2 log inactivation as a function of all those flow rates and UV absorbances. And we use that baseline model to monitor the performance of this reactor whenever we installed it in a small rural system in Colorado. And whenever you look at this slope of this observed versus predicted MS2 inactivation, uh, comparing the slope of a challenge test that we did over the course of the year to that validation that we did at the bench allowed us to assess whether disinfection performance was less than predicted in the white zone or better than predicted in the gray zone. And what we saw was that even though we didn't clean or maintain or do anything with this UV disinfection system, we still maintain performance of disinfection at least as good as when we first installed it and when we validated it at the bench. <clears throat> so that was really exciting because we noticed that throughout the year there were really challenging conditions for UV. So this um, water treatment plant was experiencing turbidity that was leaking out of their slow sand filter and um, that can present a challenge for UV disinfection whenever you have high turbidity, particles in the water that block UV light from reaching microbes. Also, at different times of the year, there were low UV transmittance values, but despite these challenges, the UV disinfection was at least as good as what we predicted. Um, and one of my students has been focusing on really high turbidity conditions, kind of looking at worst case scenarios uh, where filter upset conditions can most negatively impact small utilities or uh, point of use household scale water systems. And my student, Judith, she has been looking at turbidity values that are super high, orders of magnitude higher than what you design UV disinfection for. But despite these super challenging conditions uh, measured over the course of the year across a range are uh, using indigenous spores, which are really resistant to inactivation, we see predictable, measurable UV disinfection uh, even under these super challenging conditions. Another thing that we noticed from that implementation study of the UV LED system, uh, my PhD student Yijing and undergrad Amanda have been working on this, is that when we looked at the microbial communities in the biofilm of the tubing uh, coming out of the reactor, we saw that chlorinated water had a different microbiome than the microbiome in the biofilm coming out of the filter effluent and coming out of the UV LED effluent. So this is telling us that chlorine is causing a shift in the microbial communities. And sure, that's interesting, but why it's important is because of the shift in microbes that it was pushing towards, uh, because the both the chlorine and the UV were treating filter effluent. So what we noticed in the chlorine biofilms was that it was preferentially increasing relative abundance of genera that can contain pathogens and opportunistic pathogens, especially those that can be problematic in rural contexts. Um, so those are some of the UV LED studies that we've been focusing on. And now I wanna share some of the eczema lamp studies that we've been focusing on. 
One of them, another study by my PhD student Yijing, is looking at disinfection of antibiotic resistant bacteria. And whenever comparing the eczema lamp to traditional low pressure mercury lamp, we saw that the eczema lamp emitting 222 nanometer disinfected this antibiotic resistant bacillus better than 254 nanometer. What's really exciting is that it also prevented transfer of that horizontal resistance gene to bacillus that were not already resistant. And it did this regardless of whether we exposed the cells in a whole cell matrix or whether we just focused on extracting the DNA and really well controlling um, the conditions of the experiment. So this is great that certain wavelengths can disinfect antibiotic resistant bacteria and prevent horizontal resistance gene transfer better than traditional UV. Another type of problem that we have focused on that this wavelength can help is destruction of toxins. So harmful algal blooms produce algal toxins such as microcystin LR and undergraduate student Zana Lecieski, she measured the degradation of this microcystin LR by UV-222 and UV-254. And what she saw was that the rate constant uh, for degradation by the eczema lamp was much higher than for the 254 nanometer lamp. That means it was more effective at degrading the algal toxin. And what's really exciting is that even though these eczema lamps are still in super early stage, they have barely been optimized. They don't have the development history that low pressure lamps do. Despite all those challenges, it's electrically on par in terms of how much energy it's going to take to achieve this better level of toxin treatment. So this is really exciting that it could be a potential solution in the near future. And not only could it be useful for toxins like this, it could be useful for similarly UV absorbing problematic compounds that cause taste and odor or other types of toxins. One uh, and this is across a range of water qualities. And we did some of these analyses in co collaboration with USGS. The last UV-222 cheerleading study that I want to share about is that UV-222 reduces E. coli regrowth better than UV-254. And, and this is despite they achieved similar levels of disinfection uh, on the basis of UV dose, but whenever we expose these samples to light, which activates the photolyase enzyme in cells like E. coli, and they're able to repair the DNA damage that is caused by UV, we saw that after low pressure disinfection, cells were able to regrow. But after 222 nanometer disinfection, cells continued to die off. So we didn't see evidence of any or much repair with the 222 nanometer light. So it's really exciting that 222 can also reduce this drawback of UV where you can have regrowth due to photoreactivation. So those are some of the ways we've been focusing on optimizing mercury-free UV using specific wavelengths emitted by really exciting new UV sources for managing microbial water quality. But as I was touching on with that photo repair study, we still have this drawback that there's no residual and there can be repair and regrowth. Uh, but some of the ways that we've been thinking about managing this is to apply UV throughout distribution or throughout where water is used. One of the ways we've been looking at this is uh, investigating ways UV might be applied in point of use devices or at well water or at community taps or in municipal systems uv might be applied in transmission mains storage tanks large building plumbing distribution mains or in point of use or point of entry household systems so we think there is a there are ways that could be uv could be implemented all throughout these one of my students daniel ma phd candidate he focused on trying to determine, okay, well, if we're going to do this, how far apart does UV need to be to maintain acceptable risk? Um, and he was looking at the context of a rural developing community where people collect water in a package from some centralized form of treatment, and then they transport it or store it 
before ingestion under conditions that could permit photo repair because of sunlight exposure. And we looked at the risk over different exposure times and we saw that there was this, it's the opposite of a sweet spot. So there's a time when it becomes most risky before risk starts to decrease because at first risk increases because of photo repair, but eventually solar disinfection takes over. So Dan modeled this across a range of uh, collection times and exposure times, which is really a reflection of how far people had to walk or how long they have to store the water. Uh, and we saw that that sweet spot occurred uh, at this, this pattern of exposure times. But what this can be translated into is really in a rural context, determining, okay, how far apart do UV treatment applications need to be spaced so that everyone is in the safe zone. No one is in the risky zone for whenever there might be risk from regrowth before solar disinfection takes over. And thinking about in more centralized contexts or in uh, places where we might have um, rural communities relying on a water treatment plant, we can think about that we might apply UV at several different stations throughout to maintain risk below that acceptable level. Uh, something we've been thinking about in my lab and that happens in the US is centralization. So there might be communities located within the vicinity of a water treatment plant, but they're not served by it. And so communities consider regionalization or extension of pipes, but Having really long pipes presents its own challenges with water pressure and maintaining microbial water quality. Um, and so using this risk-based approach, we can figure out, okay, what will, how, how many UV booster stations would we need to apply to maintain microbial water quality and keep those people safe? And so finally, one way we've been looking at getting over this last barrier that we've identified so that we can apply UV everywhere, to keep everyone safe is the requirement for electricity. I've seen other people in the literature relying on human power of pumping a hand pump, turning a dynamo to generate electricity and then power UV light. Uh, we've been looking at harnessing power from gravity fed water systems or pressurized water systems to use hydroelectricity to power UV, especially LEDs, which require very low power. And uh, we've been working on this with some collaborators in mechanical engineering, and we're very excited about it. But to summarize, these are the ways that we're trying to overcome these boundaries for implementing UV disinfection. And what we've seen so far is that our UV LED disinfected water one year with low cost and zero maintenance. And we're finding very many promising possibilities for wavelength optimization using non-mercury UV sources and that we can use this risk-informed planning and technological advancements to enable implementation of UV throughout water systems or throughout rural areas where it's needed most. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, and now we will proceed uh, to our last speaker, but not least. Uh, we have Anne Galdos Balzagori. Ana is a leader of Safe Water in Mexico and Knowledge Management Unit in Canta Azul. Ana's project, Safe Water in Mexico, aims to design and implement water treatment solutions in developing regions. Ana, uh, she holds a BS in Environmental Science and MS in Public Health, and she is interested in exploring the human health effects of environmental exposures from a multidisciplinary approach. Currently, her work is focused on creating knowledge that contributes uh, to solutions that guarantee the human right to access water in rural communities. Please join me in giving warm welcome to Anne. Thank you. Um, I think that I am having some technical problems with the video, so, well, sorry, I think that you cannot see me. Um, well, I'm very grateful to be able to share with you our experience. Um, so thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to present some of the results of the Save Water project, which is a transdisciplinary project laid, led by the Ulster University. 
The consortium includes the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, the University of Medellin and Antioquia, Antioquia Science and Technology Center in Colombia. In Mexico, the work done was led by Cantar Azul, and this is the experience that I'm going to share with you today. Um, next one, please. Household water treatment and safe storage uh, provides a solution that for many contexts uh, remains the only medium term alternative. Many different technologies exist, are widely used, and there is evidence of their positive impact. Um, but they are also they, they also present several important challenges. Most of the systems are designed to treat and store around 20 liters per day, so their use is reduced to drinking water and few other domestic uses. And in contexts where there is no pipe water to supply water um, the, the, to supply water to the household, it is very common to find multiple and different types of containers in the households to store water. Um, since not all the water in the household is treated to um, the exposure and the consumption of unsafe water remains a common practice and limits the effectiveness of most technologies. Guaranteeing water quality is another common challenge uh, as water must be stored after treatment. It is very common to observe water recontamination due to the lack of the necessary hygiene conditions to keep the water safely stored. And these systems also represent a significant burden for the end users in terms of operation and maintenance. It is a burden that is added to the multiple tasks that they already have to carry out on a daily basis. So to address these challenges, it is important also to understand that the rural areas, that in the rural areas, gender roles divisions for water management are very common, while men are usually responsible for water management at the community scale, women are the ones who manage water at the household level. They are responsible for ensuring enough water every day for all the needs of the family, and that means that they have to transport the water to the household, they have to store and distribute it in, within the household. They have to make sure that it lasts for the whole day, and that for that they have to make a smart use of it, and they also have to treat it and keep it safe. Next, please. At Cantar Azul, we have been working for 10 years in a region that is called Los Altos in Chiapas, the southwest of Mexico. This is a rural indigenous region and one of the most marginal sites in Mexico. After having worked with around 100 communities and knowing their needs and challenges, we designed a system with three main purposes to increase treated water availability in the household to fulfill the human right to water, to provide access to treated water at key points in the household to simplify exclusive use of treated water, and to avoid water storage after treatment to reduce the risk of recontamination. So the concept was to have a household level system that provides safe running tap water. Next one. So the safe water system consists on a point of entry water treatment unit that includes a raw water container located in the bottom level of the support structure and another container for treated water at the top level. The bottom container can receive water from multiple sources. Then the water is pumped from this container through the treatment components and into the top container for safe storage. The treatment processes consists on three filters and a UV disinfection chamber. And the key element of the safe water system is that it uses gravity to distribute water from the top container through pipes to taps installed in places in the household where people carry out practices where water is used. We installed taps at least at two points in all the households, at the kitchen and at the hygiene setting. Next one. 
The intervention um, also included the delivery of the results of the water quality tests in each family. So they, they could have a feedback on the impact of the system. We gave them a report like the one that you can see here in the photo, and we explained the results to them with the results of before and after the installation of the system. Next one. We used a step wage randomized trial to design to evaluate the effectiveness of the intervention with a sample of 187 households. For those of you who are not familiar with this type of design, I will explain it briefly. You can look at the graph to understand it better. Um, a baseline, which will be time zero on the X axis, all households started in the control group and in random sequences crossed over to the intervention group during one of the seven post baseline steps. So in the last step, all the households were in the intervention group. And in this way, all the households in the study were part of both groups at different time, times. Post baseline steps lasted two months each, more or less, and the total follow-up period of the study was 15 months. All the follow-up pieces were conducted in, um, in all study households to measure the outcomes to each step. Next one, please. So now I will explain a little more about the methodology. We used the design that I have just explained to assess the impact in a quantitative approach. We also use another methodology to obtain qualitative results. And today I would like to share with you some re uh, results obtained through both approaches. For the quantitative results, uh, well, they were obtained through eight household visits in which we collected water quality data and also information through interviews and structure observations. The main results that I will share today are indicators of water quality and behaviors related to water. And for qualitative results, we conducted four focus groups with women, six individual interviews to women also, and we also held reflection sessions with the field team to collect testimonies that they heard from uh, during household visits. Today, um, I will share the results obtained to these questions that we ask to ourselves. That is, what are the aspects that women name when expressing the changes they perceive after the intervention. Next one, please. So the first results that I will present are those of the quality of the water that the families reported having drank recently. We, uh, um, the respondents were asked to identify the container from which they, mostly, um, they most recently drank. And I would like to show you first this photo of some of the points where we took water samples. In the second photo being from the top left, you can see one of the tap of the systems, but the rest are the typical containers where drinking water is stored. Next one, please. So this graph shows the percentage of households with contaminated drinking water by step and by group. The first thing that I would like to highlight is that the percentage of households with contaminated water in the control period is very high. So we can understand the conditions in which this population lives. At baseline, 80% of households had E. coli in their drinking water containers. During step one, the percent, uh, the percent of households in intervention with E. coli dropped to 37% and remained lower than control households throughout the study, despite seasonal variation. So we observe a significant improvement in the quality of drinking water. During intervention periods, 32% of households had E. coli compared with 85% of during control periods. Next one, please. In relation to behaviors associated with water, I would like to highlight 
three results. Um, one, that the most uh, households discontinue the practice of storing water in multiple containers after the, after the installation of the system. Uh, the other one is that we observe a change in the habit of drinking treated water as it increased from 42% during the control period to 89 during intervention period, and that only 9.5% of respondents uh, in intervention period with access to disinfected water reported drinking from uh, a point of access or, or, or um, a container different than the tap of the system. These results show that the system has contributed to reduce water storage and facilitate safe water consumption. Next one, please. For the qualitative results, um, we divide the women's responses into four categories. Those that make life easier, those that have to do with mental health, with physical health or security. And we understand that all of these categories somehow contribute to improving the quality of life. And some of these women literally mentioned that they were noticing a change in their way of life. Next one, please. So for, for the category of life is easier, women say things like that they don't have to boil water anymore, that they fetch less water and wood, that they don't have to walk long, long distances, that the water is in every household, that the water is close by, even inside the house, that it's easier to serve the water, it's easier to store the water. So, and this was one of our purposes, to facilitate water management for women within the home. These, so these results confirm that the intervention was able to respond to the needs of making life easier for women. Next one, please. For physical health, um, women spoke about the health of children and adults. They perceived a reduction in gastrointestinal illnesses, but they also talked about benefits in pain associated with fetching and distributing water, such as back, neck, and body pain. Next one, please. Um, the women said they feel calmer now for different reasons. They talked about how they no longer have to worry about fetching water and that gives them peace of mind, especially to those who suffer from some pain. They also feel more relaxed knowing that they, the water is safe. And they also comment that it calms them to know that their children do not suffer so much. Um, women women are also have the burden of caring for the entire family, especially children. So we understand that this change in their lives has brought them calm. Next one, please. And the secure category, in, in this category, we included all the comments that spoke about situations that place them in a position of vulnerability. And they even named how they used to fight over water in the community before the intervention. In this community, the water is so scarce that there are families who will spend their whole night waiting for the water to sprout again, and they used to come to fight. They also comment that they feel safer because of the quality of the water. Next one, please. And I would like to end my presentation with two ideas that in my opinion are useful for any context. One is that solutions might be designed to make life easier. Households that require a home scale system often have to deal with many other tasks and water management, especially treatment and safe storage are not always a priority. So the technology must be chosen once we understand the needs of the context and we must always work together with the population that will receive the technology um, that in most cases are women. So it is necessary to include them from the beginning, from the designing phase. And the other one 
is that it has to do with with the understanding that the biggest challenge is to making to uh, it's making access to save water a sustainable outcome. For this, we we must not forego to include a strategy for the maintenance of the systems while designing the intervention. The Save Water Project included a strategy for maintenance during and after the intervention. Today, I have not talked about it, but I wanted to highlight it here because it is always the biggest challenge and we should allocate resources and effort to find creative ways to achieve this. And for ending, I would like to share a two minute video so you can understand better the context and hear some testimonies. Ali tas venta le kushelan la la bat bunko tik shkal tik venta ti wo elde tunel kun tas venta kushle hal odile tunel kun he chalek chkil o kushelan ta ora muyuk shabu ta panka ali muyuk shabu ali masta lu pochel ha je kuchala abak ano hit le ta yutil hina kuti kojene abak ano he ka muyuk shabu ta chach kutukal ta lu kutukal Tesha <tose> Ketla sahkel ti muyuk se kusi masilel te dikto moko boto mas sake da chama ikun guti was kali as melda da stok ti wasilan kusha sel na kaltale muyuk bu masa ti ibah kuti gilel muyuk bu masilel muyuk ha Janja hutuk chikil kuti ke okhe lem sha ocha kushle hal kuti stage et Thank you so much, Anna. It's always good to hear about Kanta Azul uh, projects. Um, that concludes our speaker section for today. Thank you for all the speakers for the insightful and mind-opening talks. And uh, now we will move to uh, on uh, to the panel uh, discussion. Moderating our panel today, we have Rachel Gear. Rachel earned her BS in civil engineering and MS in environmental engineering, and she currently pursuing her PH in engineering education uh, at Purdue University. Rachel's previous research has focused on PFAS remediation, photochemistry, disinfection, and water supply in developing countries. Her current work, which uh, the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship uh, Fund, focuses on qualitative uh, assessment at the college level. Thanks, Dana. We're gonna go ahead and move to the uh, panel discussion portion of our presentation. Um, so there are quite a few questions in the Q&A and we're gonna answer those in just a minute. So feel free to keep submitting. Um, we're gonna start with a directed question for each of our speakers. So we'll start with Anna. Um, Thinking about the project, what kinds of concerns or resistances did you observe in the communities about implementing water treatment systems at both the household and community scale? Well, um, in this particular region, um, it is very important to know that the communities have local authorities 
that provide their services for free and that each family must also participate and cooperate to be part of the community and be able to count on the services and benefits provided by the community organization. So in communities where there are conflicts and families are divided, it can be difficult to install a community scale water treatment system, for example. Um, it is also a region that has been benefited by governmental and non-governmental projects and programs. And we have observed a certain like, lack of confidence that the system can offer them a real solution. Um, we have also seen some resistance to the use of chlorine for water disinfection, especially because the chlorine used in disinfection is not here, is not normally adequate for water treatment, and the dosage is not very controlled, and they have bad experiences with the taste and the smell. Um, and while communities suffer more due to the lack of availability of water and quality is not the highest priority, so they tend to be very willing to receive solutions to increase the availability of water, and they are generally in agreement with improving the quality. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sure a massive change is difficult for a lot of reasons to adapt. I'm glad that we're seeing a positive start to that. Um, Bhavani, a question for you. Uh, what has been the trend of women empowerment over time? Um, what direction do you see it going, specifically looking at the responsibility of collecting water falling to women? It's an interesting question, right? So... I mean, as I think as the scheme rolls out successfully, you'll find far fewer women going to collect water. Whether it's a question of empowerment, definitely it would save them some time. But what we see is it's two different things. When you are disconnected from a resource, your understanding of that resource goes down. So, so a woman in an urban setting has really no good sense of water tables how much water they're consuming. Well, they pay for the water, but that's that's about the only measure, but not what is really, how it's really impacting the water for the entire community. Not like when you see a well or a pond or a lake or a river. And so that disconnect between natural resources and women, in some sense to me is also disempowering. So while you empower an individual woman in terms of her her time poverty, her effort, uh, her health, um, there is a larger price we may be paying as, as humanity as a whole. So they, we need to figure out a way where our understanding and our connection with natural resources stays despite technology and despite convenience. And this would be my answer. I hope that kind of answers your what question you had in mind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that insight. Um, and Natalie, asking a, a somewhat similar question here, what has been the trend in community scale versus decentralized water treatment over time? Um, and what direction do you see that trend moving forward? Is, is that all also addressed to me? This one is addressed to Natalie. <laughs> um, yeah, but if you want to follow up whenever I'm done, feel free to jump in here. So Absolutely. at least in the United States where I've done um, my work primarily, uh, what I'm observing with rural water systems, and this is coming from the top down from the government, there's been a push toward encouraging communities to pool resources, work together, and um, either regionalize or centralize systems. Um, and so regionalizing, they pull together like human resources and training and money. Um, but then that that has some geopolitical problems. But then the extensions, like we were showing with extending the pipe to a nearby community to serve one that maybe had been on a private well or something like that, it has its own problems with it because the longer the pipe, the harder it is to maintain the water pressure and the water quality. And so kind of looking at the cost benefits of those trade-offs while serving them previously unserved populations um, but doing it in a responsible and sustainable way is difficult so yeah that's what i've been observing in the u.s is pushing toward that and so we need to make sure that we have the technologies in place to be able to push that direction while still keeping people safe 
Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, and then a general question for kind of all three of you to answer, um, and maybe we'll start with Bhavani first. Um, but what is the, the next step moving forward for your team and your project? What are, what are the upcoming steps look like? Um, for the project on WISE, I think it's very important for us to um, prove the connections between sanitation and water. So there are, there are many households that have access to clean drinking water, and yet the water at their household level is contaminated. So there's something that's going on, and we feel that's very strongly linked to their sanitation practices. And for us to to actually to be able to figure out if that's what it is that is going on, I think that's the most important part. At the same time, really work very hard towards uh, behavioral change in those communities. That would be the hardest. Yeah, the behavior change is certainly a difficult part of that. Um, Natalie, do you want to go ahead and answer next? Yeah, so mine is more from a technolo technological standpoint. So UV LED technology has recently undergone a lot of development. There are a lot of players in the field putting out new types of devices at different scale. But what I would really like to see is implementable eczema lamp technology or um, one day UV LEDs might be able to be available at that low wavelength, but I think the benefits are too great to justify waiting on LEDs. So I think uh, we need to move forward with something that could be field implementable for eczema lamps to help solve some of these problems. So that's what I would like to see and be able to actually do some field translation studies and get at some of these problems that people have been bringing up in the Q&A about challenges of implementing really low wavelength UV for uh, challenging water quality, quality conditions. Yeah, that'll be really interesting to learn more about. Thank you. Um, and Anne, do you want to answer as well? Yeah, well, for this project in particular, um, we we want to focus more in the maintenance that I was talking about, because we, uh, as I was saying, we build on a strategy, we um, train and we hire four people in the community as community technicians. Uh, and they, they installed the systems, they did um, follow up visits and maintenance during the project but they are also, uh, they are still working in the community with this role. Uh, so we're following up with this strategy uh, and trying to understand how can we keep supporting these, um, well, the needs that the community may have and, and learn from this experience because as I was saying, this is the, the, the biggest challenge. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, we have a question here in the chat. Um, I think, Natalie, it might be helpful for you to answer this one. Uh, the question is, do you think application of UV in these communities is a technology problem or a cost implementation problem? Um, so maybe from your perspective, what that difference is between technology or cost? Yeah, again, I'm going to bring a, a U.S. perspective here. That's that's where I have most of my experience. So in the U.S., I think it is a, it's a, I can't remember how they worded it, but it's a human problem because in the United States for municipal water systems, we are required to have chlorine. Um, so this whole idea we have of having distributed UV booster stations throughout large pipes, small pipes at the point of use to maintain that microbial water quality, there's this huge barrier that we're always going to have to use chlorine even if we don't need it to maintain the microbial water quality, if we have an adequate UV disinfection. So that part is a huge human and um, social barrier. But I, I would think from a more rural context that it, it might be a little bit of both. Um, a lot of these UV technologies, even the smaller scale ones, they do seem like they're still cost prohibitive. I, I think the needle is moving in the right direction, but hopefully some of these technologies like the combined hydropower LED system so that you're not having to like um, put in more infrastructure like a solar panel or other types of electricity generation. Um, we think that that might help move the needle um, in the right direction. Thank you. Um, and we have uh, kind of two questions here for your presentation. One is, uh, what is the water source that you're using for your system? 
And then the next part of that would be uh, if you could talk a bit about the maintenance of the system. So how regularly do people need to check on it and how often do parts need to be replaced? Well, there's, they use multiple sources. Um, in most of the households uh, during the rainy, rain season, they use um, rainwater. Uh, but, well, I guess that the question, well, they were also asking if they were using groundwater. No, it's not the case. They normally use spring um, sources, uh, sources springs and, and rainwater, but they can use uh, and mix different water from different sources. Um, that was the purpose of the, of the design also, because that's the reality. And the maintenance, during the, the, um, the implementation and evaluation, we did uh, seven follow-up visits just to see how the, the, the systems were performing. But we just did a maintenance in two scenarios. One, if there were any failure that can put any health risk in the household, or if they asked for maintenance. Um, we didn't, um, we didn't um, did any maintenance just because we saw the need, but people had to ask for it because we were also trying to uh, promote like this maintenance strategy. And for that, the families, um, they need to see that uh, need. So, uh, and right now, Mm, they they are responding to that um, need when when families report a failure or something that the uh, that the system needs to maintain. Well, um, they go and do this maintenance. So it depends a lot on the household. They we just ask to the families to uh, do some cleaning to the raw water tank. Uh, but not to the top and we, that has this uh, treated water. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if I answer it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, and we have, let's see, about four minutes left for the panel discussion here. So just one final question for all three of you to answer. Um, how can organizations such as the IUVA and IWA contribute to and support this movement of empowering water in promoting safe water access. And then on top of that, how can our webinar participants also help this movement? Um, so Bhavani, do you wanna answer first? Um, like I mentioned before, it would be wonderful if people who are representing organizations that work on water problems uh, lend their voices to shape policy. This is a very powerful way to actually uh, shift things at a much larger and a global scale, and that would be one way. Um, but for researchers who are working, uh, try not to stay in your labs only, but um, try to actually go to the field, um, spend some time with people who are having problems, because when you're designing technology, uh, it tends to work in one, one place, in one context, and always will fail in, in another context. So the more understanding you have of the problems there are, the better your solutions design would be. And um, yeah, as much as possible, build capacity in the people that you're working with uh, so that there's no dependence on you, uh, either for technology, for anything. Thank you. Um, Anne, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, well, I agree with everything you said. I mean, I think that it's very, very important that we learn from each other and and, and that we start having like a, a more transdisciplinary mind, a way of thinking. And that means that we need to learn from different disciplines and also different um, stakeholders because the challenges that are very, very big and, um, yeah, sometimes we we focus just in one discipline and we don't understand that the reality is really complex. So these, I think that these kind of webinars are very important to understand that um, 
that technology uh, interacts with people. So we need to understand what people need. We, we understand what are the, what people, what, what kind of ideas they already have, what are, how are they organizing and try to, to work together. Yeah, thank you so much. And Natalie, do you want to close this out with your answer? Yeah, I would just add and kind of thumbs up both of these things that were said. As a person whose lab, or we do tend to stay more in our lab under our nice, tightly controlled conditions. Um, we do love being able to interact with others and go into the field, but we have noticed that it's sometimes can be hard to do that, to like break into it. Um, and so I think organizations like IWA are great at bringing people together so that you can learn who the players are that you need to talk to and um, develop relationships so that you can like, get introduced to people and learn what the problems are, not just secondhand from the people that are actually working in the communities, but actually starting to build those relationships um, and going to the communities. So I think that's where organizations like IWA can really help and IUBA. All right, thank you so much to all three of you. It's great to hear stories both in the communities um, and to also hear the technical research side of how we can continue making progress and advancing these technologies. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it back to Hadas and Dana to close us out. Yeah, thank you so much. I want to extend a big thank you to all of our speakers, to our moderator, uh, Rachel. And before we end, I want to share with you uh, uh, with you all a final poll. Um, and now the uh, the screen goes to jump in yeah here. Uh, we want to learn uh, about the future, what we can, uh, uh, which webinar and which like topics uh, would you interest uh, you most? Um, so uh, so we would love if you will uh, help us to learn that. Uh, in a few seconds, we will share uh, the results, and we would love that you will. We will keep you posted regarding our next uh, webinars and what we are uh, plan for the future. Can can we can we share the results? Okay, okay, interesting. So I think that we know what we want to do, which webinar we will do next. Um, so please, Hada. Um, thank you very much, Dana. So first I'd like to thank the International Water Association for uh, supporting the IUVA in this joint webinar. And our focus was actually to combine different disciplines, also from the academics, but also from people that, uh, the women that work in the field in implementation and also in women empowerment. Uh, can you share the next slide, please? Um, in addition to that, uh, we would, the IWA would like to invite you to uh, two new exciting uh, webinars. Uh, one of them would be uh, on insights and innovation for advanced water treatment. And another webinar would be on Senate Action, Understanding Urban Sanitation Regulation and Challenges. So please join these webinars, should be amazing. Um, next slide, please. Um, in addition to that, uh, those that uh, join will get a discount from the IWA. Um, we would also like you to invite uh, joining uh, also the IUVA, uh, which is the International Ultraviolet Association, and I'd like to take um, a few minutes to uh, summarize the webinar. Um, first, uh, we need to understand what is water insecurity. So water insecurity is the inability to access and benefit from affordable, adequate, and reliable safe water. And the term affordable is very important when we talk about low middle income settings. This is something that we really must um, um, also emphasize. In addition to that, what is well-being, uh, especially for women? Um, well, well-being um, is that sense of, uh, which people feel extreme positive emotions. 
and the feeling of happiness. And it was actually proven in many studies that the access to safe water improves the emotional state of women and their well-being. So therefore, uh, gender equality and women and water are two very important things that come together. Now, looking at, for example, um, at the SDGs, uh, clean water relates to SDG both 5, 6, and 10. And women uh, generally feel responsible for not only for fetching water, but also for having water that is safe. UV actually can play a huge role in providing safe water, especially in the centralized uh, um, rural areas. However, uh, as we said before, UV disinfection is not widely implemented. And therefore, we um, looked at various cases and tried to analyze them to understand what are the challenges, what are the gaps, and what are the opportunities in the future to use UV disinfection in various rural areas. It could be also in schools. It could be connected to solar panels that are anyway in the field or in schools. It could be in healthcare facilities. Also, in addition to that, UV does not change the taste of water, and in many cases, water taste is a sensitive issue. In addition to that, we must look at various things that are required. All the UV does not require addition of chemicals. There is an energy demand. So we need to see what are the energy sources. Is it solar? Is it hydropower? Is it connected to the grid? Um, in addition to that, uh, for example, we need to look at adoption of technologies. So there is a social trust and a social barrier in adoption of technologies. This is something that we also must look. In addition to that, water financing. So how are we financing, financing these systems? Is it by donors? Is it by NGO? Is it by social uh, corporate social responsibilities? Is it by government? And we also need to look at regulation and politics. So all these things uh, come together when we think about um, UV systems and the way which uh, UV systems are implemented. In addition to that, one thing that we know, noticed in our research is that when we train women to be the water ambassadors to actually measure and analyze their water quality, this is also something that, um, that we saw uh, that is very empowering because then women have the control over not over only the qual qual quality of the water, but also the quantity. Unfortunately, and I'd like to um, end by, by this, um, there is, is an issue of climate change. And those that pay the price for climate change are mostly people that are low middle income settings. And, and one of the most painful things is that those that pay the price have less money. And um, it results in flooding. Uh, the flooding results in water contamination. The flooding results in, in addition of microbial contamination to the water. It results in sickness. Um, and it results in many, many negative uh, phenomena which impact the safety of the water. And therefore, this is something that we also must address and look, how can we actually mitigate climate change, flooding, droughts, and all these cases, especially in these low income settings. So this is something that is very important uh, to look at. And uh, UV disinfection can serve as an alternative. It can serve as a, as a treatment technology um, that can uh, be used in various cases, as we said before, in, in, in schools, at household level, in the community level, um, uh, uh, in hospitals. Um, but of course, there's important to use the technology correct. And the only way for us to make an impact and make its change is to work with organizations uh, like Amrita and Kantar Azul and other organizations. And we welcome all of you uh, to join also the IWA and also the IUVA and um, to work with us to make this change. And thank you very much. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's it. So thank you in all the languages in the world and we're one global community.